The pastor is dead from a poisonous snake bite, the tenth time he'd been bitten and the tenth and final time that he refused medical treatment. He's one of a community of Christians who say vipers are as vital to their services as the Bible itself. This was Pastor Jamie Coots three months ago, doing what his father and grandfather did before him in this tiny church in rural Kentucky. Risking his life to praise the Lord with poisonous snakes. I know it's life or death every day. I realize that. I, I choose that. I believe this is what the Bible means. Coots and his followers believe they are called by God to handle venomous serpents. It comes from a passage from the Bible, which they take literally. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. By the time we met him, Coots had himself sustained nine separate snake bites. A rattlesnake bit me here, a rattlesnake here. Including on his middle finger, each time refusing medical treatment in a demonstration of his faith. It was the most pain I guess I've ever felt in my life. In another small church of fervent believers, we saw the pastors lay hands in healing prayer and dance to the collective adrenaline. Pastor Andrew Hamlin appears almost possessed by the Holy Spirit as he handles poisonous snakes. I am in the United States of America. How on earth is handling a snake a religious expression? Uh, just the same way, uh, to me, taking up serpents in our religious ceremonies is just like uh, the Catholic who use wine in their communion on Sundays. It's estimated that 125 churches use poisonous snakes during services in the U.S., many clustered in the South. Both preachers offered a rare glimpse inside this extreme branch of the Pentecostal tradition for the Nat Geo show, Snake Salvation. Oh, Lord, we believe you, Lord, good Lamb of God, is a Lord of Moon. The Tennessee law banning ownership was passed back in 1947 after five worshipers were killed over the course of two years. Pastor Coots even had a parishioner die in 1995 after refusing anti-venom following a bite from a timber rattlesnake during service. No charges were ever filed in Kentucky. If someone gets bit in my church and they're not immediate family, I will call 911, have the paramedics come out, and let that person tell them I don't want medical attention. So you don't think you're taking the Bible out of context or too literally? No, ma'am. Not at all. I mean, I mean, to me, that's what God taught us or taught me to be right. I mean, I'm not telling people to go out here and handle snakes. To me, a cult is somebody that stands up and says, if you don't do this, you're hell bound and you're not a part of us. Are you a cult? No, we're not a cult. We're Christians. If you've got a husband or wife, you... We're just like any other Christian on the face of this earth. Do you see yourself handling snakes in the future? Honey, I see myself as long as there's breath in my body taking up serpents. If they're lying, cheat, steal it, fornicate. Yeah. Coot says they live by a stricter moral code than most. The Holy Ghost ain't there no more. And if their way of life, along with the way they choose to worship, sets them apart, they believe it brings them closer to God. It's an inner peace. You don't think about nothing else. You have a love for everybody. There, there's no ill feelings, no nothing in your mind except, you know, God has honored me to let me feel his spirit. Some people feel that that is the presence of God, and some people think it is a biochemical reaction that your body is having to fear, to danger, to life and death situations. If the Bible told me to jump out of an airplane, I would. Last Saturday night, in a scene much like this one, the rattlesnake Pastor Jamie Coots was handling turned on him, biting him on the hand. I was just standing there, and I seen him get bit, and he dropped the snakes, and he picked them back up. Cody Coots, the pastor's son, then brought his stricken father home. When paramedics arrived, they examined Coots and pleaded with him to receive medical treatment, but the family declined. Everybody that knows Mr. Coots knows what his, his belief is in this, and he had no intention of going to the hospital, and, and he, they did, in fact, refuse treatment. If he lived and woke up in a hospital, he'd have blamed every one of us, because now he was a firm believer. He would not go to a hospital. He always told me, you get bit, you either die at home, or God brings you through. Pastor Jamie Coots lost his life, but held strong to his faith. If this is the way God means for me to die, fine. Let me say I don't 
wish to die of a snake bite because it's excruciating pain, it's suffering, and it causes persecution to be brought upon the church. But I had rather die by a snake bite at home with people praying. So their justification for performing these very deadly acts is goes all the way back to the book of Mark in the New Testament. And these signs, Jesus, he's about to ascend to heaven. And he says, these signs and 10 days later are going to accompany you whenever you go out and preach the gospel. It will happen 10 days later on the day of Pentecost. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So out of these five, the other three are relatively easy to fake. We're going to come to all of these, by the way. I'm going to do this in a series of sorts. But let's deal with these two today. They shall take up serpents and they shall drink poison and it'll not hurt them. Many have tried to refute this snake handling business by saying, well, why don't you take up poison and drink it? Well, believe it or not, some of them actually have. There is five signs in the book of Mark where it says they shall take up serpents. Then it says, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I wonder how many of them got a jar of some kind of deadly thing and drinking a deadly thing. Come on, man. Once you take a drink of any deadly thing, once it crosses your tongue and you swallow it, there's no going back. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, shall not hurt them. Them two is put together for a reason. They's harming them. The Cody's have supplied the bottle of lye for tonight's service, but Big Cody has also brought another far deadlier poison designed to attack the central nervous system. Street nine. There's probably about 475 drops in that jar. I know people's died from it. The old man Williams and them mixed the same jar up out of the same stuff we mixed that out of, and one brother drank a half a jar at night, and the other brother drank the other half a jar, and four hours later, they both fell over dead. It is so hard to get a hold of strychnine. It is pretty powerful. It's got a lot of people scared, including me. I'm a friend of God. Come on. Are you a friend of God? I'm a friend of God. Come on. You know how come I'm a friend of God? Because if I do this whatever so he tell me to do, I'll be a friend of him. Yeah, come on. We got these 22-year-old and 23-year-old brothers. Yeah. All they got on their minds is snake this and the snake that. They done lost that zeal for God. Well, them people are crazy. I ain't crazy. Come on. I realize what God won't have done. All right. Come on. I'd rather a street nine jar right here take me out than to get out there, out and seen in a car run me over and I die Amen. lost. Come on. That's my buddy. Come on. I got another thing. You can't tell me God won't help you. You can't tell me God won't heal you when you're down sick. People say the devil's going to take you out of here. You let him take me out. I'm ready to go, boys. Not all people's going to drink street night, but if you can just be willing to die for Jesus Christ, you'll see things a whole lot different. I thank God for everything he's done for me. The Bible says drink any deadly thing. If they drink anything, it shall not hurt them. And I'm still here. So once again, let's come back to these verses and you say, well, Stephen, you'd have to be an idiot not to say that this was clearly the command given by Christ. Any learned teacher of the Bible knows he is speaking to the immediate church in his vicinity right there. This is not a command to all believers forever. How can I prove that? Well, there would be a phenomenon, first of all, <laughs> a very worldwide phenomenon known to everyone that whenever you become a Christian, you can literally drink any poison and it will not kill you. You can go on out here and play with snakes. You can speak in entirely different languages. You can cast out the demons and you can also, hey, there'd be no pandemic because the Christians are on the earth. And we can just lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I'm not mocking what Jesus said. I'm mocking the modern church. Their interpretation of this thing is entirely distorted. Once again, he's speaking to the ones in his vicinity because they are such a small group about to go out and to preach the gospel. They're going to be in very dangerous territory. 
dangerous positions they're going to find themselves in because the world, the flesh, and the devil are going to be working heavily against them. And Jesus is saying, I'll protect you the entire time. You say, well, Stephen, that sounds all nice and dandy, but where's your proof biblically? Just go two verses later. It's the very final verse in the book of Mark. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Even contextually speaking, these signs were to accompany the preaching because this was an entirely new religion. They would be going out into these lands whom have never heard of Jesus before. They didn't even know to expect a Messiah, a Jewish Messiah. And so there would have to be something that the people could see that would distinguish this new religion from all others. And we see this throughout the book of Acts. But many believe that this immunity to snake bites was fulfilled with Paul on the island of Malta. You see... He got there, the people of Malta, they were kind of, they didn't really know much about Paul. They didn't know anything about these newly shipwrecked Romans in whom were getting off the ship. Many of them were prisoners, Paul included. They were kind of scared, nervous of them. Paul comes up, he starts to make a fire. It's obviously probably cold and everything. He starts to make a fire and there's a viper that jumps out, bites him on the hand and he shakes it off into the fire. Immediately, the people... The spotlight goes on Paul, so much so that the people of Malta actually believed that Paul, for a little while, was a god. And of course, Paul immediately probably said, look, I'm, I'm not a god, but I'll tell you of the god in whom protected me from this snake bite. And that opened the door to uh, preach the gospel to all of them. You see how it was used? These signs were used for the preaching of the gospel, to convince the unbelievers. That's a big point. So now the glaring differences come into view. That of Paul being bitten by a viper unwittingly, and then these modern-day church handlers in a church where people have known the gospel since they were little babies. Everyone's heard of Jesus where they're at. And my point noting that is because there is no reason why these people need to pick up rattlesnakes in front of people in whom have already heard about Jesus in order to do what? What's the spotlight? Where's the spotlight going? Is it going to be shined on the gospel ultimately? Or is it shined upon the person in this case? Which brings me to my next point. If you'll remember, whenever Jesus, he goes out into the wilderness, at the very beginning of his ministry, he goes out into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasts for 40 days, 40 nights, doesn't need anything, and he's near death. He's as weak as any human has ever been. And then the devil himself comes up, begins to tempt him. He first tempts him with bread. Of course, you're going to tempt an incredibly hungry man with bread. He says, why not turn these stones into bread if you be the Son of God? He knows he's the Son of God, but he's wanting Jesus to uh, have a bit of pride like himself and to prove that he's the Son of God, but Jesus doesn't do that. So he says, why not turn these rocks into bread and eat them up? Jesus simply replies, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then comes verse 5, the second temptation. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, Jerusalem, and setteth him up on a pinnacle of the temple, the highest place among all the Jews. And there's a reason why he took him to this exact position. And saith unto him, if thou be the son of God... Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Now what's the devil doing right here? He says, look, you're in front of all Jerusalem. You're on top of the temple itself. You have this opportunity to prove that God is with you by this act of faith, if you will. You can put your life in danger. And by God saving you, you can glorify yourself. To which Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now right here's my point in referencing the snake handling business. Cambridge commented at this point about what Jesus replies to Satan. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 6.16 is where he's quoting from. The verse ends though, as ye tempted him in Massa. In Deuteronomy 6.16. The reference to Massa in Numbers 20 
shows the true meaning of the Savior's answer. Moses and Aaron displayed distrust in God when they tried to draw to themselves the glory of the miracle instead of sanctifying the Lord. Remember, the people are thirsty, they're wanting water, and God says, go up and speak unto the rock. Well, what do they do? They go, Moses goes on up there and he strikes the rock. And then he says, look, I will give you water. So he's taking the glory for himself for this. So what Jesus meant in response to Satan, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, Jesus is meaning that he will not glorify himself in the eyes of the Jews by a conspicuous miracle. His work as the Son of Man is to glorify the Father's name through obedience. Which brings us right back to these ignorant snake handlers. Who are they glorifying in this? Is Christ getting any glory for this? Or is it rather, look at how faithful I am. Look at how close to God I am. To which brings us to the close. That of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Whenever Paul says the fruit of being filled with the Spirit is handling snakes and healing the sick and going about here and drinking strychnine. And uh, well, of course it is. No, it's not. The fruit of being filled with the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Meaning, this is all acceptable in God's eyes. My friends, I'm certain that you've heard it said that Satan will try to snake his way inside of churches. But how spiritually blinded do you have to be to bring actual deadly snakes into your churches? Putting everyone at risk now. And instead of preaching the gospel and exalting Christ, you exalt a serpent in front of everyone. The serpent throughout scripture has always been identified with Satan. Satan and serpents just go hand in hand. 